Good morning. Welcome to Lake City Christian Reformed Church. Whether you're here in the building with us or you're joining us online, we're just happy you're with us. My name is Chuck and I have the privilege of helping to lead you in worship this morning. At this time, let's go ahead and stand up and greet one of the people around you. If you see somebody that you don't know, please introduce yourself. I'm 
coming of the God of Jacob, whose love endures through generations. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm coming on the God of Moses.
may go ahead and have, be seated. And at this time, we are going to go ahead and dismiss our four and five year olds to the back for class and also ask our cadets to come forward this morning. that organized. That's impressive right there. <laughs> so uh, my name's Joel Clark. Uh, I have the privilege of working with all these guys and these, these boys up here. This is our cadet group. And for some of you who don't know um, what the cadet group is, it's a boys club that our church has for boys from six years old all the way up to sixth grade. Uh, we meet every Wednesday night over in the junction right over here uh, from 6.30 to 8. Um, each, each night um, we, have, we do three things, kind of following um, Luke 2.52 of Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So each night um, we, we put a large emphasis on God's word and learning verses um, and playing, and then doing practical projects. So the projects that we do could be just something for fun to do, or it could be something practical. One of the boys is going to share one of our practical projects that we did this year that um, we kind of took on for the senior cadets. Um, and then at the end of each year, um, we do what's called a cadet auction. And that auction is these boys get what are called cadet bucks for saying verses, being, um, having attendance, bringing their Bible each week. So they save up all those bucks and then at the end of the year we have an event, um, a little dinner for the dads and the sons to come out and then the boys are able to purchase stuff. It's really a fun time. So um, I'm going to introduce Larry Fee here and then he's going to share more about the junior cadets. Yes, so I have the privilege of working with a number of other guys. So to my right here is Bob Clark. To my left, Tom Janinski. Did I say that right? Close? Close. Close. Eli, Levi rather, Fletcher. And then Leif, he's sitting down there. He could have been up here too. So um, with the different boys, actually, we have probably just a fraction of the boys. A lot of the boys that come actually don't attend here. And um, so we have the ability to reach out into the community and reach other boys as well. Some of them aren't church attenders either, so it's a good program to uh, reach out to them. So some of the things we do in our uh, time is we work through a book, and the book has different stories, and it always ends with a, a key idea and a, a key verse. So um, the first uh, lesson was about God, and for our project, we made a wristband that was made of three wires, um, red, black, and white, so one represented God, and the other the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then our second lesson was on uh, a personal God, and that we, for that lesson, we made a uh, a walking stick that we would hey, let's walk with God as our as our influence in our life. And the third one was on uh, Christ's salvation, so we made a cross to represent that one. And then lesson four was on the Bible, so. Uh, we focused on Bob Clark Scott here. We made this uh, Ten Commandments. Some of you might have seen that if your boys brought that home as well. And so now what we're going to do, hopefully junior boys, we're going to go and run through the Ten Commandments for him. We hope. All right, so here we go. Number two, you shall not make for yourself a carved image. Number three, 
You shall not take the Lord of the Lord your God's name. Number four, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Number five, honor your father and mother. Number six, you shall not murder. You shall, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not steal. You sh number nine, you shall not bear false witnesses against your neighbor. Number ten, you shall not covet anything that is your neighbor's. So that's one of the things we focused on this year was the Ten Commandments, and uh, and then next year we're hoping to maybe introduce not only that but either the Lord's Prayer or Psalm 23. So we're just trying to make sure the boys uh, get their the God's word in their heart. shall not murder. God said, if you even call somebody Raka, you've sinned. You've killed him. Okay. What would it, which commandment would I break if I saw a neat snowmobile go, oh, I wish I had that. I want that. I got to get that. Which Number 10, you shall not covet anything that is your neighbor's. So, it was more than just memorizing the commandments. It's how we live them and how we use them in our lives personally. So, that was a goal and they did amazing work. <laughs> All right. While the senior cadets, just scoot <laughs> this way a little bit so folks can see you. All right, so this is our senior cadet, and like Larry said, this is just a fraction of uh, some of the boys that we get. So we're going to start right here with Caleb. Share your share a verse and what you enjoyed about this year. Uh, Philippians two fourteen through sixteen. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure children of God, without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. John, John 3, 16 through 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Did you guys have anything that you enjoyed about this year that has been like a highlight for you? I liked doing the dirty cards. I liked the senior cadet camp out. I liked the racket and the dirty cars. I like the snack and <laughs> derby cars. And do you have a verse this morning? <laughs> All right. Some guys, they these two know a lot of verses, but getting up can be a little intimidating, which I can't. Yeah, and Gabriel? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ is our Lord. Romans 6, 1 and 2. Perfect. And then this is one of our projects that we did this year, and Gabriel's going to share a little bit about um, what we did with it. Um, all these boys, there are some future electricians here because these guys did an awesome job wiring this board up. So you want me to hold that and you kind of explain what we got here? This is my electrical board, and we wired all these together, and when it plugs into the wall, you can plug a, something in here, and it has a light that can go out. So, these guys all did an excellent job, and it was a little scary when the first one, first cadet plugged it in, because we're like, is this going to work? <laughs> is this going to come through? We didn't know if we were going to be testing the church's insurance policy or what, but they all did a great job. It was a lot of fun to see them dig right in, and, and that's the practical stuff that we want to be training our boys is that 
so that if they ever need to fix something in their house when they get older, they got it. So um, I just want to also thank, you see the other leaders up here, John Pearson, Dr. Hobbs, Jonah Hookwater, um, Ryan Vredevog has uh, was worked with our projects for these boys. Just did an awesome job. And um, I also want to thank uh, Randy Takuma, uh, Ben Payne helped us out with the electrical boards. Just these guys coming. Um, and if there's somebody else I missed, um, uh, David LaRoche uh, also is one of our leaders. Just thank these guys too for the investment that they put into the kids each and every night. Um, and one other thing, um, before we get done, if there is any guys out there that are looking for a way to get plugged in with kids, um, please come and talk to me. You may see that, oh, you guys got plenty of leaders, but a lot of us guys, some nights we're like, I am stuck at work, I'm wrapped up. It's okay, we'll fill in, but if you, some of you other guys want to get plugged in, please come and talk to me. If you want to come and share some night with something, please come. And also, we're still looking for stuff for the cadet auction. So if you would, give these guys a round of applause. Show your appreciation for their work. Appreciate Joel heading all of them up. That's a, a big undertaking, to keeping all going. He's just done a great job with these guys. We're going to invite the rest of you to um, stand and sing a little bit more as we uh, prepare our hearts for the message today.
we thank you that we found a friend in you. Lord, we thank you that we can take our trials, we can take our temptations, Lord, we can take the burdens that we carry, Lord, and we can lay them at your feet. That we can give them to you, that you will help us carry them, that we are not alone. Lord, I pray that we would find that, that peace the peace that comes from laying the hard things of life at your feet, Lord. Lord, help us to recognize um, where we fall short. Lord, help us to see the things we're carrying that we don't even recognize. May we come to you this morning. Lord, may we see the God that you were that you are and that you promise to be. In your name, amen. Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break. At your name, still, call the sea to still, the raging need to still every way. Of every name, his name is 
At his knee, at his name, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. His name is? Jesus. Lord Jesus, we gather, we worship you, we lift up your name, the name that is above all names. The power that is above all powers, the authority that is above all authorities. The love that's above all love. We bless you. Come and bless your people as we gather in your precious name. Amen. Hey, as you're seated, just turn to the person next to you and say, the peace of Christ be with you. Wasn't it um, fun having the cadets up here this morning? I just want to say thank you to the leaders and the, and the parents for engaging the kids and kids coming. Hey, cadets, um, hey, come on back up here for a minute, would you? All the boys, come on back up over here. I want to show you something. Um, I need your help a minute. Come, come, on, uh, come on back up here. Just, you guys can do that. Just scoot right back up here. I know um, you're learning a lot of things, so I have some things that I want to show you. No, come over here. Come over here by me. Yeah, come over here. Um, I have some things that on the table here that I, I wanted to show you that I, I think you would be kind of interested in seeing. So, first of all, let's imagine you have to go outside, and it's dark. Maybe your dog is outside, and it went out in the woods, and your mom says, hey, go out and call the dog, and it's really dark. So if you had to go outside at night, and it was really dark, would you like to take a candle with you as your light? And saying, I'll go out in the woods with my candle, or would you prefer a high-powered flashlight? flashlight? Yeah, you would prefer that to the candle. All right. Why? It has a bigger light, right. All right, now let's imagine for a minute um, you're going to build something. I know, I was told to demonstrate this. I'm supposed to put on my safety goggles. How about that? You had to drill a hole. See this old-fashioned hand drill? Would you like to drill um, with one of these? See if I can get it working here. Or would you rather use one of these? You choose DeWalt over this. Yeah. Sorry, Mark. We tried, you know. Why would you rather have this? Because it goes faster. It goes faster, right. There's a lot of power in that. Look at that. I can, I can drill all kinds of holes. Pretty simple with that, right? Well, let's imagine you're going to build something, and you're working with your dad or with one of the cadet leaders, and you got a cut on this board. Would you like it old, saw like that? Or... Would you prefer your dad helping you and taking one of these? You'd prefer that. Yeah. It's a lot louder. Yeah. You think that would be easier to cut the board than this? Yeah. Yeah. It, would be easier. it would be easier. So you're saying when we use the flashlight, um, when, we use the, when we use the drill, when we use the saw, the electric saw, that makes work go easier. How come? What do all these things have that the other tools don't? Because they go faster and... They go faster and they have more power, yeah. right? They have a lot more power. They're a lot stronger. Now, the reason I'm showing you all this is because power tools are kind of cool, aren't they? I know. The question we're going to ask today in the, in, the, in the message is, we're talking about Jesus. And the question is, is he just an ordinary man? Or does he have special power? Is he just an ordinary person? Or is there more to him than that? That's the question. What do you think as we get into the Bible? Is Jesus just an ordinary person? Or do you think he has power, special power. What do you think? All right. You think he has special power, and power makes things easier, doesn't it? Yeah, it helps us. You keep that in mind. Thank you for helping me. You may go back to your seats, and we're going to keep asking that question this morning. Who is Jesus, and is he just an ordinary person, or is there something more to him than that? Now, why is that an important question to ask? 
is because as we talked about last week, Jesus is our lifeline. He's the one that we count on to help us. He's the one we go to um, for the forgiveness of the sins and to deal with the places where we've messed up. He's the one that's gonna help us with our problems. And is he capable of really helping you or not? Does he have the ability, the power, the authority to help you when you need him? That's the question. Is he an ordinary person, or is there something more to him? Turn with me to Mark chapter 4, where we're going to take a look at two stories this morning, familiar stories. Uh, we're going to take a fresh look at them, and we're going to take a, uh, ask a, and notice <clears throat> that in both of these places, there are some questions that are asked. We're going to look at two strategic questions. By the way, as we look at this, we've been asking the question, who is Jesus? And we've been listening. We, we've listened to the angels. We've listened to his father. Today, we want to listen to his friends. What did the friends, the people who lived with Jesus, who followed Jesus, who hung out with him, who ate with him, who walked with him, who listened to his teaching and watched his miracles, what did they say about who he is? You know the big question that's going to come this morning is who do you say that Jesus really is? Turn with me. Mark chapter 4 is where we're going to a familiar story. We're going to pick up our reading in verse 35, but first I'm going to invite you to stand um, for the reading of the Word of God. <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we just pause before you. And Jesus, as we've said, you're the name that's above every name, that at your name... Every knee will bow and tongue confess that you are Lord. Sooner or later. We want to confess sooner that that is who you are. We want to understand more today about who you are. We want, to, we want to be able to not only see it, but believe it. And in believing it, we want to follow you. So Holy Spirit, come. Give us ears to hear what you have to say to your church today. For we pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Mark chapter 4. Excuse me. <clears throat> I want to clear my throat. Mark 4, beginning in verse 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drowned? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind completely died down, and it was completely calm. He said to the disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Grass withers, flowers fade, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen? Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you pull out your worship notes, you can follow along. I invite you to keep your Bibles open as we take a look at this text. The first question we're going to ask is, the question the disciples asked, who is this? Who is this? Let's take a look at the story together. <clears throat> and so we are um, in northern Galilee. Let's take a look at where we are on a map. We're at the Sea of Galilee. So here is the Sea of Galilee, uh, Mount Arbel, Capernaum, Bethsaida, um, all those are there. So we are up here. Jesus spent most of his time um, right here. We call that the Triangle. Uh, religious triangle where Jesus spent a lot of his time. So in the Capernaum area, he's going to go now across the sea. And so we're in Galilee. We're at the Sea, uh, we're at the sea of Galilee. This is early on in his ministry. And the text says that that day when evening came, he said, let's go to the other side. Here's a beautiful picture of uh, sunset, evening on the Sea of Galilee. It's calm, it's beautiful. There's Tiberius over there. No, it didn't look like that first century. These are all lights going on here, all right? But it's a beautiful setting. You can see the mountains around and how calm it was. That's kind of the setting for our story. He said, come on, 
Um, let's go. And so it's a beautiful evening. He's been teaching all day. He's been with his disciples. And so he says, we're going to go to the other side. Now, um, in this case, we're going to find in chapter 5 that he's down in the Gerasenes. So um, he's going to go from Capernaum, and their plan is just to kind of go down um, the Sea of Galilee. By the way, Sea of Galilee is about 13 miles long, uh, about 7 miles wide, and so that's their intended track. Now, if you look at the text, it says, um, leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. Now, there were also other boats with him. So several followers of Jesus were with him, not just the 12. Um, here are some pictures of some fishing boats um, from that day. Um, archaeologists found a first century boat, 25 and a half feet long, 7 and a half feet wide, 4 and a half feet deep. Um, it had a deck on the bow and on the stern. Um, it would have a four-man crew, five-man crew, actually. They could use either sails or oars, carry up to 10 people in it. So this is on the Sea of Galilee. These are some fishing boats. So several boats gather. It's in the evening. They're going to go across the lake. You got the picture. Sounds kind of nice. Let's go for a little cruise across the lake. And so as you can imagine, they get in the boat, and, and they're starting to, you know, the, they're starting to row. <clears throat> And I just imagine they're talking, talking about um, what Jesus said that day and some of the teaching and processing that a little bit, um, joking with each other, kind of having fun, um, and just kind of, you know, kind of debriefing after the day. And while they're going, um, you can imagine wind picks up a little bit, there's a little breeze, feels kind of good after a hot day, the breeze picks up a little bit more, there's a little spray you know, they probably just picked up their cloaks and kind of drew it in a little tighter around their necks because they're getting a little wet, uh, a little damp, and so they keep talking, and, and they're not really paying attention, but all of a sudden, the, the wind picks up a little bit more, and the waves pick up a little bit more, and then a wave kind of hits them and kind of splashes over the bow and, and kind of gets a few of them wet. And now they kind of look around and man, the sea is kind of picking up, and then there's another gust of wind, and the waves get bigger, and now another wave crashes over the bow, and then one hits from the other side, and, and now all of a sudden, they're, they got water in the boat, and the guy's in the center, man, they got to start bailing, and they're soaked, and the conversation stopped because now this is serious. We, we got a problem here. The text says, a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it's nearly swamped. So here they are. Now those waves are coming in, and the guys are really, the oars are pulling hard, and then another one hits, and, and now you've got a few inches of water in the boat, and another wave hits, and now there's a foot of water in the boat, and the boat's getting, you know, sinking down, and this is serious. At 682 feet below sea level, with the mountains all around it, Sea of Galilee was like a bowl. And there were a couple of valleys that came in from the west, and that wind would come in, and, and they all of a sudden could turn that water um, into, um, uh, into a storm quickly. They could get up to six to seven foot waves here are a couple, there's a picture of some of the waves on the Sea of Galilee that were pretty good size. Can you imagine being in one of those boats with waves like that? I've told you the story when we were there, um, during the night a storm hit. And we're in our room and it's got a sliding glass door out to this little patio and it was hitting that door so hard at night it woke us up and it's like, is this thing gonna hold, right? I mean, this was really pounding. That wind can pick up quickly. And so all of a sudden they went from, hey, this was a great day, this is, let's take a little bit of cruise across the lake into, now we're in trouble, this is serious. We get hit by one more wave like this and we're going down. Now let me add a little factor to it that we don't understand that they would understand. The, the Hebrew people um, were not water people, they were land people, they were, all right, they were nomads. And so water represented chaos and evil. And now they're in here, and now all of a sudden, chaos and evil has kicked up. It's like evil wants to take a fist and smash us right now. And they're terrified. Can you imagine how they would feel? 
All of a sudden, whoa, this is serious. This is life-threatening. Now we're in trouble. And they're all in trouble. In the middle of all that, Jesus is with them. And what is Jesus doing? Anybody want to guess? You can see it in the text. He's sleeping. You've heard this story before. In the stern, on a cushion, could be some sandbags. You're right. Here's the text. He's sleeping. Now, here's the question. How in the world could Jesus sleep through that? I began to wonder that, and then I thought, well, <laughs> actually, I've been pretty exhausted sometimes, and I've slept through stuff. <laughs> Jennifer tells the story, because I was sleeping. <laughs> when we, um, we were living in this log house in the woods, and it was summertime, and we're in bed at night, and she sleeps uh, next to the wall, and there was a window there. We had the window open, get a little bit of breeze in at night. I'm snoring away, and she hears outside the window a growl, and it responds to my snoring. So it's like I would snore, then there would be a growl. I would snore, then there would be a growl. She's terrified. She can't wake me up at all, and right outside the window is something growling back. Who knew I spoke bear in my sleep, right? <laughs> we were having a wonderful conversation. And I was out. She's terrified. I'm like, you know, out completely. So apparently I can sleep through things. And apparently Jesus was too. I'm sorry. Back to the story. Back to the story. If you want to hear how that one turned out, you got to ask her on that. Back to the story. So Jesus is asleep. They're terrified. And they wake him up. And what do they say? Look at the text. Jesus, teacher, don't you care if we drowned. Think about that for a minute. Think about that for a minute. When, when God doesn't respond in the way we think he should, in the time he, he, he should, when we're faced with some serious stuff and we're in trouble, our fear and our anxiety goes up and we're still in a situation, what's often the story we write? God doesn't care. God doesn't care. My wife left me, I lost my job, you know, uh, there's sickness, and I've been praying and praying and praying and nothing happens. We still have financial problems, we still have this situation going on with our kids. We keep calling out and nothing happens, therefore God must not care. You ever, you ever write that story? Come on. I have. I told you the story, I'm in the low season of my life, I was having a conversation with a friend, and yeah, I was in one of those places where I was like, where is God in this? And, and then he said, he said to me, and I've shared this with you before, he says, oh, I know what it is. He said, you're the only person on the face of the earth that God's forgotten about. <laughs> I did the same thing you did. I laugh. It's like, oh, that's ridiculous. But that's exactly how I felt. And when he said it out loud, I thought, oh, because what do we know to be true? Has there ever been a place in Scripture where someone was hurting and Jesus did not have compassion on them? No. What do we know about who God is? We know he is a God of loving kindness. We know that he is a God of mercy. We know that he is a God of love. How do we know? Because he sent Jesus, his son, to help us, right? And yet we write the story, God doesn't care. Let me turn that around. Rather than asking, does God care when I'm in my storm, probably the better question is, can you trust God for your storm? Can you trust God for you in the storm? See, it's really what it comes down to. It comes down to an issue of trust, doesn't it? When I'm in the middle of this and I can't understand how God is working, I don't know what he's doing, it makes no sense. All I know is I've got heartache, stress, pain, whatever it might be, and we just cry out. It's like, God, are you there? Are you paying attention? That's exactly the way the disciples felt. And no wonder, their boat's filling up with water. They're a long way from shore. They get hit by another wave. They're going down. And what does Jesus do? This is so good. Look at the text. Jesus gets up. He rebukes the wind and the waves. Quiet down, be still. It's like, you, it's like your dog's barking when the doorbell rings or somebody knocks on the door, and you say to your dog, be quiet, go lie down. 
And the dog goes and is quiet and lies down. That's what Jesus is doing. He gets up and he says to the wind, Hey, pipe down. Shh. Quiet. And immediately, the wind stops. Immediately, the waves crash in on each other and the sea turns calm. Here's a picture of a calm Sea of Galilee. Can you see the difference? Wow. Now, what did Jesus do? He blew really hard to blow back against the wind. Nope. He put out his fingers and electricity shot out. And he, Nope. What did he do? He spoke a word. He just said, be quiet. And that was it. That was it. Think for a minute with me now. Where else in Scripture... Do we have someone just speaking and the natural world responds? Come on. Genesis 1 in creation. Yes. God says, let there be light, and there was light. Let there be stars in the sky and lights in the sky and galaxies form and and spin and, and move off into space, and they're still doing that. He said, let there be life on the land and animals start to appear and start to crawl. With just a word, the natural world responds. With just a word, Jesus speaks, and the natural world responds. Have you ever tried to stop a wave? Have you ever been in the ocean? You know, you're standing there, just, you're just trying to stand up. Can you stop a wave? No. Have you ever tried to get outside and stop the wind when it's really blowing? With just a word. What does that tell us about who he is? Now, John was in the boat, right? One of Jesus' friends. Turn with me to John 1. John connects the dots. Connect the dots with us this morning. John 1, 1, he's talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And that light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. What are we learning about who Jesus is? He is the creator God. He was a part of creation. And with his word, he has that kind of authority and power that creation, the natural world around us, responds. Wind and waves that could be destructive, listen to him like your dog listens to you. Wow. Can you sense the power that's there? Can you sense the authority? Can you sense the strength? By the way, the the big question is, who really is Jesus? Who is he to you? Is he big enough to handle the storms in your life? By the way, fast forward a couple weeks. We're gonna get to, in a couple weeks, we're gonna get to Holy Week, And we're going to get to Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. We're going to see in the story, Jesus is going to get spit on. He's going to get beaten with a stick. He's going to get whipped. He's going to then get, you know, nails pounded into his hands and his feet. And I'm going to ask the question, is he a helpless victim that he is getting bullied and he's getting beat up that he can't do anything about? Remember who this guy is. Remember that with a word, he could have earth open up and swallow all those people who are doing that. With a word, he could call for lightning and lightning would turn him to a crisp. With a word, he could just call for legions, armies of angels that would come in and turn things around. You see, that last week of the life of Jesus when he's suffering, he is not a helpless victim. He is on a mission. He is power under control. He has strength that he is not using. Why? Because he's the Lamb of God who's got to take away the sin of the world. He's on a mission to rescue you from your sin and from death and from hell. And the only way he can do that is to go to a cross and to pay for your sins and for mine. Friends, I'm going to tell you, nails did not hold him on that cross. Love did. Can you see it? This is the one who can speak a word and wind and waves stop. He could have stopped this He could have stopped the suffering at any moment. Why didn't he? 
because he was being obedient to his father. He was being obedient to the mission. He was loving you that much. Come on. You remember when we're reading this in you know, in a couple of weeks, this is who Jesus is. Even the wind and waves obey him. Wow. Let me go to another story with you for a minute. And I want to ask another question. Are you with me? This was near the beginning of Jesus' life. Let's fast forward and go towards the end of his life. Turn with me now to Matthew 16, and I'm going to ask a different question. This was the question that Jesus asked. The question is, who do you say that I am? Who are you say that I am? By the way, Jesus said in, this, in, the, in the previous story, he said, why are you so afraid? Do you still... Um, not believe, or you still have so little faith, do you still not trust me? Really what it comes down to is, do we trust God with our storms? Do we trust God with a situation of our life that appears out of control? Are we willing to trust him with the things that make us afraid? Now we've got a second question. Who do you say that I am? We're going to, turn in your Bibles to Mark, or Matthew 16, please, if you will. We're going back a little bit. Uh, Matthew 16. Now, let me, um, this is a very fascinating thing. We're getting towards the end of the life of Jesus. He is, he is still up in Capernaum. Let's put it up on a map here a minute. I want you to be able to see this. So, um, so he's still here at the Sea of Galilee. What you can't see is Jerusalem is down, is down here, all right? Jerusalem is down here about 100 miles and um, he's gonna go down for the Passover in, in just a little bit. In, in a few weeks, he's got to go down for the Passover. And so what does he say to his friends? Let's go up to Caesarea Philippi. All right? Caesarea Philippi, let me get my little, is up here. See it? Galilee, Capernaum, Caesarea Philippi up there. Okay. Why in the world would he go up there? It, it's kind of like you're saying, you're going to take a road trip to Florida for spring break in a couple of weeks. And it's like dad announcing, hey gang, everybody get in the car, we're going to Canada first. <laughs> we're going where? We're going to Canada. Aren't we going to Florida in a couple of weeks? Oh yeah, but we're going to Canada now. You're right, that's the same thing. It's like, why in the world, when he's got to get down to the Passover in Jerusalem, that's a good five day walk, he's going to take a two day trip just to get up there, um, to Caesarea Philippi. We find out he spends a, about a week or so up there um, and then travels all the way down. Seems like a little inefficient. Seems like you're going out of the way. Why in the world would Jesus go from here to here before he would go all the way down here? Good question. By the way, that's why we've got to read the Bible with a map. There is something that's going to happen up in Caesarea Philippi that can only happen there. What Jesus is going to do is he has to nail down for them who he is, who is what his identity is. There are two events that's going to happen up there, two main events. There's more than that that's going to happen up there. But there are two main events that are going to happen up there that's going to clarify for his disciples who he really is. They need to have this so when the suffering and death happens, they've got a framework to go back to to understand why that happened. One of the events we talked about last week up on Mount Hermon or Hermon was the transfiguration, but there was an event that happened before that that's significant. So let's go up to Caesarea Philippi. What do we know about Caesarea Philippi? This is Sin City. This is a place where no good Jewish boy would ever go. All right? What we have here is a Syrian god, Baal. The worship to Baal is there. If you remember, Baal is about, um, about the economy, about, about uh, fertility of the crops. It's about, uh, it's about money. You've got the Greek god Pan is up there, worship to Pan, and there's a lot of things that go on with the Greek god Pan. A big part of it is going to be sexual immorality. 
and you have the Roman god um, Caesar, um, the emperor worship going on up there, which really um, identifies all of the political power. Basically, we, he is going up to Caesarea Philippi, and it's the worship of all the gods of the world, money, sex, and power, is all centralized up there on the northern border of Israel. And he says, boys, we're going for a walk. We're going up to Caesarea Philippi. Now, why in the world, what has to happen up there that can only happen there? Why can't they just have the conversation down in Capernaum? It'd be a lot easier. Can't we just like hang out here and talk? Jesus wants to show them something. Oh, you got to see this. All right. So, we're in verse 13, Matthew 16. Keep your Bibles open. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? By the way, he hasn't asked this question before now. They've kind of been piecing it together. They've listened to his teaching. They know the Old Testament and the connection there. They've listened, watched his miracles. They've been putting together who he was. And he says, now let's, well, you know, when you would ask people out there, who do they say that I am? It's kind of interesting, the answer that they give. They say, well, you're John the Baptist. Some will say Elijah. Some say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Wow. I mean, that's pretty good praise. That's like ha biblical hall of fame. This is like the best. That would be like asking people today, who do you think Jesus is? Man, he was a great guy. He was a great teacher. He loved people. He was kind of like a Mother Teresa or a Billy Graham, you know? We'd go, wow, that's, that's pretty good for one person to be like that. But Jesus gets personal. He asks the next question. Verse 15, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? You know, it always comes down to that, doesn't it? It's always personal. It's not what does your parents say Jesus is. It's not what does your pastor say. It's not what does your spouse say. It's not what do your friends say. It's what about you? Everyone here, including me, we have to answer that question personally. What about you? Who do you say that the Son of Man is. Peter jumps in. Peter says, verse 16, you are the Messiah or the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's interesting. Um, he says it very emphatically. You are the Christ. It's not, well, we're kind of wondering, but we're leaning towards, we think you're the Messiah, or, you know, most of us agree. It's our opinion. You know, we, we kind of think, uh-uh. Uh -uh. He says emphatically, you are, you are, and continue to be. It's a present tense. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the, the Messiah means the anointed one. Christos is the anointed one. People were anointed prophet, priest, and king. You are the anointed one. You are the coming one um, of God that we've been longing for. You are nonetheless in the son of the living God. You are the living God. Can you hear it? All right, piece this together. Where is he? Where is he? He is in the location of all the gods of the world, all the power and religious things. And in a, in a, here's a picture. Let me go back to, um, I'll show you a quick picture of Caesarea Philippi. I get so excited I forget some of my pictures. We're standing up here on the Mount Hermon. You're looking down at the Caesarea Philippi. When you go in there, there's a place where the river has come out of the mountain. That was where the place where the, uh, the worship of Pan was. Let's go to the next picture. So the worship of Pan, and there were um, temples right here. The water would come out of the mountain here. Um, this is the base of Mount Hermon. That was where Caesarea Philippi is. So we imagine Jesus standing there with, with the backdrop of all the gods of culture, all the power, all the sex and money, everything that people run after. And what is he saying? In contrast to all of that, who am I? And they said, you are the living God. You're it. You are the true God, the living God. You are the Messiah. You are the one sent by God. You are more important than money. You are more important than power. You are more important than things. You are more important than all the sexual exploitations. You are more important than anything the world could offer. In contrast to all of that, you are the living God. Can you see it? In contrast to everything the world offers, Jesus is the one who's high and lifted up. 
No wonder he had to go up there. Now it gets even better. And, and he says to him, Jesus said, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. It was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. You didn't figure this out by yourself, but God revealed it to you. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, by the way, in Greek, Peter is Petros. Rock is Petra. You are Petros on this Petra. A little play on words there. It's kind of fun. Anyway, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Haiti will not overcome it. What do you think? Can I go back to that picture minute we had with a cave all right you know what that was it was the worship of god pan and so on that happened there you know what that was called it was called the gates of hades that was called the gates of the underworld the gates of death um, where where the underworld went away and came back it was access to the underworld so jesus is standing here and in contrast to all the religions and all the all the power of the world he now is the one who shines brightly as the the christ the living god the king and he says this is what i'm going to do i'm going to build my church the ecclesia and all of that can't stop it The gates of Haiti, all the power of evil, all the power of hell can't stop what I'm about to do in my movement in this world. Oh, can you see it? And only that could be taught in that location. Only that could be taught there. So Jesus says, in contrast to all the other religions, powers, and, and pursuits, he is the one who stands alone like light shining in the darkness. And in contrast to all the darkness of evil that's in the world, he says, I'm going to build my church. And my church will prevail. And hell itself will not be able to stop it. Wow. Can you see who Jesus is? Can you see he's no ordinary man? Can you sense his power by his word to stop wind and waves and to be able to speak into our storms in life? Can you see that he is the living God in contrast to all the false religions of the world, that he is the one true God? Can you see his power in his movement as he gathers his people, the called out ones, the ecclesia, and he gathers his church from around the world and he builds this movement of his church that's changing lives for eternity and the gates of heaven Hell itself cannot stop what he's doing. Can you see it this morning? Somebody could say amen right about there. Thank you. If the church was that important to Jesus, how come it's not that important to us? Sometimes we look at church as an option on the weekend of many options. We could do this or that. Can you see how important this movement of his is? to gather his sheep, to gather his people, to redeem them, to transform them, to send them out into this world of salt and light on this missionary um, endeavor to change other people's lives with the good news of the gospel that there is hope in our dark world. Uh, You know, that, that this was what Jesus was about about his coming kingdom, about his church that's being built, about pushing back the powers of darkness, about bringing in light and love. And he calls you and me to get in on that. And how come it is when we think about the church, we kind of, oh yeah, it was so important in Jesus. Can you see it? Can it be more important to us? I know I've gone too long again. I get excited about God's word. Can you tell? Because I love you, and this is so important. I don't want you to miss it. Because all the other religions out there in the world of money, sex, power, sports, pleasure, things, materialism, you know, entertainment, they're they're after you. They're bombarding you. They're coming after your soul and the soul of your kids. And and we can easily get caught up into all that. That's why you need to know the one true living God and his name is Jesus. And what he's doing in his movement is greater than all of that. Because when you get connected with him, you're connected with life, both now and forever. You're connected with a movement that will last and not fall away. Can you see how important it is? 
And so the question comes down to this. Who really is Jesus to you? Who really is Jesus to you? Can you say with Peter, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the one that I worship. You are the one that I love. You are the one that I serve. I am a part of your movement in this world, of this church. Come, Lord Jesus. Do you have a personal relationship with him? Are you connected with him? If you're not this morning, what's holding you back? Don't buy the lie of the enemy out there in the world. I want you to see the truth of who Jesus is. Can you see it today? Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. And we admit there's just a lot of things that want to call for our attention. There's a lot of stuff out there that has a lot of, um, yeah, allurement of it. Um, the enemy's pretty good at trying to, trying to drag us away from you and from what's really important. I pray this morning that the scales will fall from our eyes, so to speak, that our hearts, our eyes of our heart will be opened, that we can see who you really are, Lord Jesus, Son of God, Savior, King, who came on a mission to rescue us, who has all power and authority in heaven and on earth, the one who loves us so much that he came to die to save us to lead our lives into what is good and to help and invite us into joining him into this movement called the church. We thank you for that invitation today. And we repent from stuff that's gotten us distracted, where we've missed it, where we've ignored it. And we want to come back to you this morning. God, we don't want to follow any other gods but you. We don't want to get stuck in our fear, but we want to have faith and trust you. We don't want to wander off after all the stuff of the world, but we want to follow the one true living God. Align and recalibrate our hearts and our minds even today. Even today. Lord, we thank you that you are still the God who's at work, that your power is still at work, that your authority is still at work, that your spirit is still at work. And so we lift up Andrea Shof to you. We thank you for a successful surgery. We pray healing in Jesus' name. We lift up Wanda Keeling and her family and the loss of her son-in-law, Cam, and we pray comfort and peace to this family in Jesus' name. We look out at the brokenness in our nation, the brokenness in our world. We see the unrest in Haiti and the war in the Ukraine and, and in Israel. And we cry out and we say, God, who can stop storms? We pray for your peace to stop the war and to bring peace. So, Lord, we worship you this morning. And we just, we just give you our problems and our stresses and our pain and our heartache our fears. God, all those places where we're afraid. And we just ask, ask you to help us to trust you. Not to write stories that you don't care because we know that you care. But to trust you. To trust you, the living God, and to step in to what you're calling us to do in this movement called the church. So we bless you today, Lord Jesus. We claim, we, we believe, and help us to align our lives with that belief that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to respond to God's word with giving of our offerings and gifts. I'm inviting the deacons forward, if you'd please come. Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, our culture says getting is better than giving or being a consumer is better than being a contributor. But we follow the ways of Jesus, right? More blessed to give than receive. I want you blessed today. And so thank you for your gifts given to him and his name. Hey, we're going to dismiss kids you can, and teachers. Head off to Connections. Um, as um, you continue in worship here, White Envelope is for cadets, um, the national office. So if you want to give um, a gift towards that ministry, um, thank you. Um, we have two groups heading off on mission trips this week. Um, first of all, we have a group going to Mississippi. 
And so I'm gonna, we're going to pray over these groups here. Um, from our church, oh, by the way, tonight at 6 o'clock, there's a commissioning um, service for the Mississippi trip. If you've got time and want to come back, um, um, we'll be uh, praying over these um, people who are going to Mississippi. But today, um, Ross and Dakota and Sebastian and Chiago, and they all just left, didn't they? All right. They like, we just missed kids, and then they left. So anyway... We're going to ask you guys to stand. Derek Fauble um, is heading on the Mississippi trip. So you guys stand. And then we got the NMC, the DR trip is heading out this week. Like, I don't know, 2 a.m. Tuesday or some crazy time. Um, Derek and Maria DeRyder, um, Jeff and Tyvin Heitzma, Hunter Fisher's going, uh, Melody Frazier and Larry and Suzanne Stahl. I want you to stand. Um, if you're going on all these trips, um, and the rest of us, let's gather around these people. We're going to lay hands on them and pray over them. Can we do that? Just quickly, somebody near you. Uh, Melody, standing back there. Somebody um, um, go and pray. Eh, thank you very much, uh, Rhonda, for praying over them. Is everybody, is everybody, we got two in the back here. Can we get, um, we want to pray for them. Can a couple people go around behind them, please? Um, don't let Jeff and Ty stand by themselves. Thank you. All right, is everybody covered? You know, we're so grateful you're going to give of your spring break to go on these mission trips, to go in the name of Jesus and be of help to other people. What a great call, what a great thing you're doing, and we're very grateful. Let's pray over them. Father, we bless you today, and we thank you that from our church family, these are going out uh, um, on our behalf to bring your love to others in Mississippi and in the DR to share your love by, um, by words of encouragement and help, by building and repairing and cleaning and cooking and in all kinds of ways meeting very basic needs. And Lord Jesus, you said when you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. As they go, may they know they're going to serve you. Fill them with your spirit. Give them energy and protection and peace and health and everything they need so that they can serve you well. And may they, as you bless them, may they be a blessing to others. May they know it's true what you said, that it is better, it's more blessed to give than receive. And may your kingdom come through their work and their hands and their life this week. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you for being willing to serve. You guys can all be seated. That's going to be great. I can't wait to hear the stories um, of what God does um, this week. Hey, coming up, um, the rest of us who are going to be here during spring break, we have Monday, Thursday service at 7, meaningful service of communion. Good Friday service is at noon at the First Presbyterian Church in Lake City. And then our Easter service, 10 o'clock here um, on Easter Sunday. And uh, this is a great opportunity to invite others. Hey, don't forget, worship team, come on up. Don't forget, Community Hope is having the 5K run walk on the 13th. If you like to walk, you like to run for a good cause, um, join me that day. Um, that would be great. And also, um, during Adult Connections, grab your coffee, come back in. Um, Nate Cucci is going to be telling his story with his cow. He's going to be here. I think that... Would you stand for the blessing, please? We love you, Nate. We can't wait to hear what you have to say. That was just a great picture, though. I did like that one. Will you receive God's blessing to you? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Into your arms, the riches of your.
Have a fantastic week, everyone.